Good afternoon. Today we're going to continue looking at the interaction of viruses with hosts. We're going to talk about these kinds of the different kinds of interactions that can occur. We're going to start talking about virulence, viral virulence. This means the capacity of a virus to cause disease in the infected host, viral virulence. So we say a virulent virus causes significant disease while a, one that is avirulent or attenuated causes reduced or no disease. So uh, you can see by the definition that it's going to be a relative term. We can measure virulence. There are a variety of ways to measure it. This is just some of them. You could measure the mean time to death if you're ex infecting ex an experimental animal with a virus. Mm -hmm. You can measure the mean time to symptoms, a specific symptom caused by the virus. Uh, you can measure fever, the induction of fever, weight loss is very typical, or the measurement of lesions caused by the virus. So polio virus, if you inject it into a, an animal, will cause destruction of motor neurons. And you can see these lesions in the brain and spinal cord. So a very well-trained pathologist can quantify those. Uh, HIV infection causes a reduction in the CD4 positive lymphocytes in the blood. You can measure that. You can draw blood and count the CD4 positive lymphocytes. Yeah. Well, you can't give people viruses, right? You can only observe what a virus does. You can't manipulate it. The key to studying virulence is to change the virus and see what happens. You can't do that in people. So you always have to make correlations. You can see one season influenza virus kills more people than another, and, but you're always... That's the natural Yeah, that's the natural, but there, you cannot often make conclusions from that. So it's very difficult to do. What you can do is observe what happens. So we know that HIV is, is virulent because it does this to CD4 positive lymphocytes. But you always have to make correlations with an animal model, which is never perfect because that's why it's a model. So it's very difficult. But in the long term, you can draw some conclusions, obviously. So here is a, two examples of measuring virulence of viruses. On the left is a graph of the number of survivors uh, after infecting mice with two different strains of polio virus. So you can see type 1 strain, the mice are all living up to 15 days. Uh, Type 2 strain, the mice are all dead by 15 days. So that's a very crude measure of virulence. So you can say that this virus is more virulent than the blue one. On the right, um, the multiplication uh, of different viruses in the central nervous system of, of an experimental animal. And here we're measuring the lesions in, this, in the central nervous system. So someone is looking at sections in a microscope and putting a number on the lesions. And you can see in three different parts of the CNS, um, the cerebrum, brainstem, and spinal cord for five different viruses, you have different numbers of lesions. Very few lesions with dengue, a lot of lesions with Japanese encephalitis virus, and some of them fall in between. So just a measure of, a way, another way to measure virulence. It's very important to remember that virulence is a relative property. It's very difficult to compare the virulence of HIV and polio because they use different experimental animals and different measurements for the virulence. So you can't really do that. Virulence is influenced by dose, route of infection, species of the animal, age, gender, susceptibility, and many, many other things as well. So unless you're measuring the virulence of two viruses exactly the same way, you really cannot compare the virulence of those two. So for similar viruses, we could take two different polio viruses like we did in that experiment and put them in animals the same way, and you can compare the virulence. But you can't do it if you have any aspect of the assay that is different. Here's an example of how just the root of inoculation in an animal will change the virulence of the virus. So on the left, we have a curve of, of virus multiplication, PFU per milliliter, and days after infection. So these are suckling mice given virus subcutaneously, right under the skin. Two different viruses, La Crosse and Tanya. And uh, these are, and then we're measuring the amount of virus in the brain here in the solid circles, 
and the viremia in the blue, in the lighter blue line. So that's lacrosse brain uh, viremia. Viremia, of course, virus in the blood. And then tanya viremia and brain. By this route, apparently doesn't multiply in the brain and doesn't cause a viremia. But if you inoculate these mice intracerebrally, you put a needle right in the brain, can do that. Mice are pretty resilient. Uh, you see the amount of virus in the brain of lacrosse here, and Tanya does very well when you put it right in the brain. And you would also say from this, of course, that Tanya is not very neuroinvasive, right? Because we're putting it at a peripheral site and it doesn't seem to be getting into the brain. So the route of inoculation can make a big difference. So you certainly have to have the same route to compare virulence. Here's another example of this, uh, the effect of inoculation of virulence. We have two different lacrosse viruses, so that's the same one here from lacrosse, Wisconsin. Anybody from Wisconsin here? No? Every state has a virus named after it. Uh, wild type virus, uh, suckling mice versus adult mice, intracerebral versus subcutaneous. Uh, in suckling mice, the amount of virus is needed to kill 50% of the animal. One virion <laughs> will kill 50% of the animals here. Same with adult IC, but then subcutaneously, you need, you need 10 times more. And this is very telling. This is an attenuated mutant. So attenuated means it has reduced virulence. It's probably was, it was engineered or selected in some way to make it attenuated. Uh, one for IC and suckling mice, over 100,000 PFU subcutaneously. And then over a million and over 10 million in adult mice. So two different viruses, two very different patterns of virulence depending on the route of inoculation. So what we try and do in virology, one of the things we try and do is to identify what makes viruses virulent. We want to know the viral genes that are involved and the host genes. And we usually do this by mutation although there are other ways nowadays. And uh, originally, it was only possible to do so by mutation. You delete a gene or you disrupt the gene that you think is involved in virulence, and you see the effect in an animal. If you have reduced virulence, you say this gene is involved in virulence, and then you have to figure out how. You have to look at the mechanism of that. So here is an experiment where we're trying to identify some virulence genes, which, which illustrates what I'm talking about. We have a virus, a wild type virus, that grows very well in cell culture. And when you inoculate this into the brain of mice, the virus multiplies in the brain and it's neurovirulent. It causes some neurological disease. So we say this virus is neurovirulent. We now introduce a mutation into this virus and that mutation impairs the replication of the virus in cells, as shown here by fewer plaques. So then cell culture doesn't grow well. You put it in the brain of the mice, it also doesn't grow well in the brain, and it's attenuated, which means it has reduced virulence. Now this is not a particularly interesting mutation, because all you've done is make the virus less fit, basically. And so it, there's nothing specific about that mutation. But look at the next one. We make a mutation in a, another gene, and this mutation does not uh, markedly affect replication in cell culture. But when you put it in the animal, it is still it is attenuated. It doesn't replicate well in the animal. It's attenuated. It has less virulence. So this is an interesting gene. This is something that you specifically need to cause disease or to be virulent in an animal, as opposed to a gene that you need for replication in general. And so those are the kinds of genes that are of interest to people studying viral virulence. So that's how you would identify such a gene, and then you figure out what it's doing. So this has been done for many viruses over the years. Mutation, infect animals, and the consequence is you could put all the viral genes that affect virulence into four different classes. All right? There are those that affect the ability of the virus to replicate, which we've talked about, which I don't find particularly interesting. There are those that modify the host defense mechanisms. That's, that's very interesting. So it's a gene product of the virus that the virus uses to somehow modify the immune response. Of course, in cell culture, there is no immune response. There's an innate immune response, but not an adaptive one. So this uh, is not going to tell you much in cell culture, but in an animal it will. And then there are genes that allow spread of the virus in the host. So those are very interesting. And again, in cell culture, you wouldn't necessarily pick these up. And then there are some that have cell killing effects. 
these could be of, of uh, these could have an effect in cells and in the animal, but not likely to affect the amount of virus produced in cell culture. So these could also be interesting as well. That, that's my particular bias on the interest of these mutations. If you talk to 10 other virologists, you might get 10 other views as well. But since I'm teaching this course, you can listen to my view. <laughs> okay, here's an example of uh, even non-coding sequences can have an effect on virulence. So, so far I'm talking about mutating uh, a gene coding for something and um, a protein and having an effect on virulence. But even non-coding regions can have an effect. This is an example of a mutation in a vaccine strain of poliovirus. So we have two different kinds of polio vaccine strains. There is one that is inactivated. It's a non-infectious vaccine. And then there's a second, which is an attenuated, we call it a live attenuated vaccine. And these have mutations in their five prime non-coding regions that make them attenuated. Uh, another example is also within the five prime non-coding region of another coronavirus called mengovirus. Uh, there's a poly C track there that if you delete it, they re that reduces virulence in mice. So you don't have to make a protein to influence virulence. The non-coding region of a virus can also have effects on virulence. This is to illustrate uh, the non-coding mutations in the Sabin vaccine strains. And we'll come back to these later. This is a very interesting story. You remember the five prime non-coding region of coronaviruses has this highly structured region. It's called an iris, and that's involved in translation. You see there are all these stem loop structures in the iris. And this one here, stem loop six, it's blown up here on the right. You can see these numbers in red. These are the, there are three serotypes of polio, and the vaccine has three serotypes in it, and each has a slightly different mutation in the five prime non-coding region that makes it a good vaccine, makes it not give you polio most of the time anyway. So this type one, it has a change here. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know why this is G to G. This should be G to A. Uh, this is a C to, so that's the type one strain, a G to A. I mean, I've shown this for 15 years and I've never noticed this mistake before. <laughs> and there's a change at uh, this position from a G to an A in the type two strain. And then in the type three strain, there's a change from a C to a U. So single base changes in each of the strains make them not able to cause paralysis. We'll talk about how that works another time. Now, you can show this effect in mice. This is actually an experiment from my lab from 1983. My first graduate student, he, took, he made two different polio viruses, and one of them had a C at position 472. And if you look back at this side, the, the parental wild-type polio sequence here is C. This is, this is a virulent virus, and the vaccine has a U. So he made two viruses that were exactly the same except for either a C or a U, at 4.72, and he injected these into mice. And you can see the C virus in red grows pretty nicely. This is growth in the brain at times after infection, and the virus with the U doesn't replicate, it's slowly cleared. And the, uh, the virus with the U is not virulent at all. We're looking at the 50% the lethal dose, the amount of virus needed to kill half of the animals. We don't reach any endpoint, more than uh, 10 million PFU, whereas the virus with a C is markedly more virulent. Okay, 9,000 PFU will kill half the animals, whereas the other one, we don't kill half even if we put 10 million PFU is, which is as much as we can put in. So a single base change in a non-coding region can have this effect. So examples of genes that modify host defense mechanisms, you'll hear more from Professor Silverstein about these. Uh, some of them are called virokines. These are viral homologs of cytokines. They are secreted proteins that mimic cytokines. Remember, cytokines are produced during the early immune responses to virus infection. And these are viral encoded proteins that mimic those cytokines. Um, and there's also another class called viroceptors. And these are virus encoded proteins that mimic the receptors for cytokines and other immune molecules. So you see they're antagonists. The, Virokines will bind to the normal receptor for the cytokine on the host cell and block its activity. So these impair the immune response. They mimic normal cellular molecules uh, and they basically uh, 
sabotage the innate and adaptive defenses, but they're not needed for growth in cell culture. So this is an example of that class of genes that you pick up in the animal. It has no effect on growth in cell culture, but has a market effect on virulence. So this is, these, if you take away these virokines or virus receptors from the viruses, they're much less virulent than an animal because they can't overcome the host defense. Most of these have been found in the big DNA viruses, big DNA genomes, that is. Uh, and these are the functions, the soluble cytokine receptors, they bind cytokines. And then there are also proteins that bind uh, key um, intermediates in the complement cascade. You remember the complement cascade is a series of proteins which uh, undergo activation when an antibody binds a foreign substance. And a lot of the m components of complement are, in fact, antagonized by specific viral gene products. There are also ones that affect antigen presentation, which I believe you will hear more about from Professor Silverstein. So here's an example of one of these um, proteins. This is an experiment where we take a gamma herpes virus 68. It, one of its genes called M3. It encodes a chemokine receptor. So this is a soluble protein that floats around and binds up all the chemokines that are produced by the immune cells when they're responding to this virus. So they can't work. They, you know, chemokines' main role is to attract cells into the infected area, lymphocytes and macrophages. Well, the virus makes a chemokine receptor that binds those so they can't work. It's a great antagonist. So here you see on the left uh, the percent survival of, of animals uh, with increasing doses of virus. We have wild-type virus in blue here. So you get a certain dose response. And then if you delete the M3 gene, which encodes this chemokine receptor, you see it's less virulent. You need more virus to kill uh, the same uh, number of mice. So <clears throat> you can see by comparing the curves how it's been attenuated by deletion of that gene. Now, if you restore the gene, here it's called MR marker rescue, which is restoring the gene to the deleted virus. It now returns its virulence to that of wild type. So that shows you that you haven't changed anything else in the genome except delete the M3 gene. So it has an effect on virulence. On the right, we have measured the, amount, the number of different cells that are coming into a particular infected area of the animal. So you can look at macrophages, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes. Um, you can do this by flow cytometry or some other staining method. And you can see that in blue is the pattern for the wild-type virus. Say, so let's look at macrophages. Uh, so you get a certain number of macrophages coming in, but if you take away the M3 gene, you get more macrophages coming in. It's telling you that the chemokine that M3 is antagonizing is now taken away. So the chemokine is working to bring more macrophages into the infected area. Other genes that are involved in virulence are those that Enable the virus to spread within the host. I'm going to give you two examples of this. Real virus, if you inoculate intramuscularly in mice, it spreads to the central nervous system via the blood. Okay? Uh, IM inoculation, intramuscular, it gets in the blood, gets into the CNS. If you do the same experiment with type 3 real virus, it spreads via the nerves, not via the blood. Okay? The gene that encodes the outer capsid protein, which is sigma 1, uh, determines the route of spread because you can reassort, thank you, we can reassort this uh, gene among the different viruses and show that that is what controls the route of spread. And this, recognize, this is the gene product that recognizes the cell receptor. Another example is herpes simplex virus type 1, a single amino acid change in one of the glycoproteins in the envelope of the virus called GD blocks the ability of the virus to spread to the central nervous system after inoculation in the foot pad. So wild-type virus, you put it in the foot pad, gets into the CNS. Just one amino acid change in GD will block that. Two examples of genes that enable virus spread. Unfortunately, we don't know the mechanisms by which these are involved in spread. Remember, I told you, you, you start by identifying genes that are involved in virulence, but really you need to know how they work. So for these two cases, we don't know how they're working. Very few viruses encode toxic proteins. Bacteria do this all the time. Enterotoxins, for example, produced by enterotoxigenic E. coli and a variety of other bacteria secreted proteins that have toxic effect. Very rare in viruses. There is one example, the rotaviruses. Those are 
double-stranded RNA viruses that cause gastroenteritis. They encode a protein called NSP4. It's the little red triangles here. And this is really a toxin. It's an enterotoxin. It is produced in infected cells and secreted uh, above and below the monolayer. So this is a epithelial uh, layer in the intestine, which is where these viruses infect. See the very nice lined up uh, epithelial cells here. They're being infected by rotaviruses and they're producing NSP4. And this has a variety of effects. The, the outcome, of course, of this infection is gastroenteritis, diarrhea. So diarrhea is fluid imbalance in the intestine. And this protein alone, if you make this protein and feed it to animals, they get diarrhea in the absence of virus infection. So this protein has effects on its own to cause fluid imbalance. And some of the mechanisms are shown here. We think that one of the things NSP4 does is to disrupt the tight junctions between these cells, and that allows water to come out into the intestine. That's a component of the diarrhea, of course. Uh, we also think that this protein binds to a receptor on the cell surface of the epithelial cells and starts a signaling cascade that results in increased intracellular calcium, and that in turn forces chloride out of the cells. And then once you do that, you get a chloride imbalance, and that, that further uh, worsens the diarrhea. So that's the second mechanism. And then finally, we think NSP4 goes below the basement membrane and interacts with the enteric nervous system. There's a whole network of nerves innervating your gut. And we think that uh, if this protein interacts with that system in a certain way, it can, it can influence the fluid imbalance in the intestine. So that's an example of a toxic uh, viral protein. Another example of a gene, uh, now this is a cellular gene that's involved in virulence. So far we've been talking about viral genes. This is a cell protein called TRIM5-alpha. Now this is a very interesting story. Um, it began with the observation that old world monkeys are resistant to infection with HIV-1. And it turns out that the block to infection is after entry, but before reverse transcription. So remember retroviruses, of which HIV is one, enter cells and then they reverse transcribe their RNA into a DNA copy. There's a block in monkeys, old world monkey cells before reverse transcription. This block is mediated by TRIM5-alpha, a cellular protein that somehow acts on the viral capsid. It recognizes the viral capsid of HIV-1 and somehow targets it to be degraded so it never can replicate. So if you take away TRIM5-alpha in old world monkeys or monkey cells, HIV-1 will replicate. So that's an example of a cellular protein that can influence virulence. So you may be asking, do we have TRIM5-alpha? Or maybe you're not interested. Is that a good question? Yeah, we do, but it doesn't work to prevent HIV infection, obviously. Yeah. So we, we're not sure why, but obviously there was some other, other evolutionary pressure on our TRIM5-alpha that changed it so that it no longer functions to block infection. You only need one or two amino acid changes to make it non-effective. MicroRNAs, I'm sorry, yes. Um, yes. In people, yeah. put uh, old, wo uh, old world monkey trim five into people. Well, you can put it into human cells, and it makes them resistant to infection. Yes, but you can't really put it into people, so we have to have something else. We have to figure out exactly how trim five works, and then try and mimic that, mimic that with a small molecule. Is there any research being done? Oh yeah, quite a bit. Listen to Twiv one twenty two. We in we interviewed the guy who discovered that and he tells the story of its discovery and, and uh, how, what kind of research is going on. Now microRNAs are also involved in viral virulence and I've told you already about MIR-122. It's a liver specific microRNA that hep C requires for replication and if you give chimpanzees an anti-MIR-122 you can make small RNAs that will bind the microRNA and block their activity. If you give that to chimps, they are, make less hep C when they're infected. So this is actually, this is called an entagomere. It's actually going to go into clinical trials in people to see if it would be useful to treat hep C. But, so microRNAs can be virulence determinants as well. Okay, so that's virulence and some of the 
ways that we're studying it and how we think it's regulated. It's by no means an exhaustive view. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about how cells, how viruses are virulent. So virulence results from damage uh, in the host. And we're going to talk about the viral side, viruses damage tissues, but also the host damages itself as well. So mechanisms of cell injury. Remember when we infect cells with viruses, they cause cytopathic effects. So we presume that similar things happen in the infected animal. So a cytolytic virus causes cytopathic effects. And this is a bit of a mystery why this happens. We're not exactly sure for most viruses, but many viruses in inhibit a variety of host synthetic processes like RNA synthesis, protein synthesis. And this really wreaks havoc on membranes. And enzymes get released from their nice containers, the lysosomes. Uh, the cytoplasm is chewed up. So we, we suspect we understand what causes cytopathic effects, and it's all viral induced. Um, a lot of envelope viruses, you remember, cause fusion of neighboring infected cells. So you get these giant cells with multiple nuclei. They're called syncytia, and we talked about that before. So this is another mechanism of causing cell damage. And virus infection also induces programmed cell death, apoptosis. So these are just some ways that we think viruses destroy cells, both in culture and in the animal. But not all viruses kill cells. In fact, many viruses, you can infect cells in culture. The cells look just great, and they produce lots of virus for long periods of time without being destroyed. So how do those viruses cause disease in, a, in an animal? Well, the answer is immunopathology, too much of a good thing. So many of the clinical symptoms of a virus disease, the nonspecific symptoms, fever, tissue damage, aches, pains, nausea, are a consequence of the host response. Remember inflammation last time, rubor, dolor, calor, tumor, the four classic signs of inflammation, those are caused by the production of cytokines. And we think that for the viruses that don't kill cells, the immune response is usually what's causing disease in you. So let's look at some examples of this. Here's a list of viruses and what we believe to be the various immune-mediated mechanisms by which these viruses cause disease in a host, why these viruses are virulent. And you can see some of them have CD8 positive T cell mediated mechanisms, CD4 positive T cells, both Th1 and Th2, and antibody. So basically, almost every arm of the adaptive response has been implicated in immunopathology. So again, what we're saying here is that these viruses cause damage to the host via these specific mechanisms. So we're going to look at some of these in detail now. So here's an experiment that you can do to show that CD8 positive T cells, the cytotoxic T cells that are important for clearing an infection, they lyse infected cells, that they cause lethality in some cases. So here you've infected a mouse with uh, an arenavirus, lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus. It's a, a virus of rodents. Usually doesn't infect people unless you have a rodent and you get it from your rodent. And if you happen to be immunosuppressed, then you're, you can be in big trouble also. But usually benign to people. You infect rodents, though, and within a week or so, they're dead. Lethal choriomeningitis. Okay, now you immune suppress the mice after infection. Mice are fine. They get a persistent infection. That is, they have virus for the rest of their life, but they're okay. So just by suppressing the immune response with, with chemical inhibitors, uh, you can keep them healthy. You don't stop virus replication, but they're fine. So this tells you that the immune response is, seems to be part of the lethality. Now, if you give them what we call adoptive immunization, you give them T cells from an infected mouse. So you can infect another mouse and take out the T cells after a certain period of time, transfer them to this mouse, he dies. So the T cells, in fact, specifically the CD8 positive T cells, are what's responsible. You can purify various subsets of T cells and put each one in and show which one is causing the lethality. So that's an example of immunopathology.
Uh, let's go on and talk about more of these CD8 positive T cell associated immunopathologies. This one is myocarditis, inflammation of the heart caused by another picornavirus, Coxsackie virus B. It's a very important infection. In fact, a lot of people who at some point in their lives suddenly have heart failure and require a, a heart transplant, uh, it's a consequence of infection by this virus. It's very hard to detect early on, so by the time you do, it's through the symptoms and it's too late to do anything. This virus doesn't kill myocytes, cardiomyocytes. It's non-cytocidal. So we believe that uh, the pathology is, is occurring only in immunocompetent animals. It's immunopathology. And the hypothesis is that CDA-positive T cells are hurting the cardiomyocytes. They're trying to clear virus infection, but in doing so, they're destroying the heart cells, and that leads to heart failure. And in support of that, if you make knockout mice that lack the gene encoding perforin, remember, perforin and granzyme are two genes or proteins that are important for CTL-mediated cell killing. If you make mice that lack perforin, and then you infect them with Coxsackie virus B, they get less severe disease. It shows you that the perforin, which is a component of CD8, positive CTLs are, are important for development of disease. We also think that these cells probably re also release uh, cy uh, cytokines that recruit inflammatory proteins, which in turn make more cytokines, and that probably contributes to the damage as well. So it's not just perforin, but probably perforin plus other things released by the CD8 cells. And in support of that, one of the Chemokines made by these cells, MIP1-alpha, you can also take the gene out of mice that encodes that protein, and also these mice also do not develop myocarditis. So this is interesting because it suggests that if we could detect infection in people very early, you could perhaps inhibit this CTL-mediated lysis and prevent heart failure. The problem is we don't, we don't know how to detect early, and that would involve screening everyone, which at this point is probably not cost effective. But as I said, in, you know, one day you're going to get up and stand in front of your mirror and it's going to tell you if you've got any virus infections. But we're not quite there yet. All right, so this is an experiment to show you what I've, what I've just told you. These are two sections of the heart of mice that have been infected with Coxsackie virus B. Let's turn the light off here. Now, I, um, why don't I tell you that a, these have been stained with, with a dye called Mason's trichome, which stains blue when the, the heart is damaged by myocarditis. So when you infect mice with Coxsackie virus, the virus destroys heart cells. Well, the CTLs destroy heart cells. You get a calcification, which is stained blue by the Mason's trichome. So on this slide, there's wild-type mice and knock, perforin knockout mice. So which do you think is the wild-type mouse? Which one? B. B. You think that's the wild type mouse? Okay. This is this is the, this is the wild type mice in A. It has more pathology. It has more calcification. It's got more staining. This blue stuff here is the staining. It's the calcification caused by da damage to the myocytes. So this is a perforin knockout where there's very little damage. You can see. So these mice don't develop myocarditis. Okay. Another example is liver damage caused by hepatitis B virus. Remember that funny virus with the gapped DNA genome with a piece of RNA and a protein on it that has reverse transcriptase? Um, if you express the glycoprotein, the envelope glycoprotein of this virus in mice, you make a transgenic mouse encoding this gene, it's no problem. The mice are fine. But if you give these mice virus-specific CTLs, which you get from another infected animal. So you adoptively transfer those CTLs into these mice. Now you get liver lesions. So those CTLs are killing liver cells because they're expressing the viral envelope glycoprotein, of course. So normally, transgenic mice notice this uh, protein from birth, so they, they're tolerant to it. But if you put in CTLs that recognize it from another mouse, it will cause liver damage. So it shows you that in principle, liver damage can be caused by CTLs, just like myocarditis can be caused by Coxsackie virus infection. 
So the way this works is that the CTLs that you inject, they attach to hepatocytes and they induce apoptosis. Remember I told you CTLs can not only lyse target cells, but they can induce apoptosis. So that's what's going on here. In addition, the, the CTLs reduce, release cytokines. Uh, these recruit other cells into the area and those enhance the cell death, if you will, the hepatocyte death. So if you give these animals anti interferon gamma antibody, it prevents cell killing. So that tells you that this is a major player. It's probably being released by the CTLs and recruiting a lot of cells into the area that are causing liver damage. In addition, if you deplete macrophages from these mice, you also prevent death. So the macrophages are also playing a role here. How about lesions associated with CD4 cells, the helper cells? Okay, they'll move away from the CD8s. These, of course, make a lot of cytokines. Remember, they make cytokines needed for B cell maturation. They make cytokines needed for CTL maturation. So they can have a lot broader effects than CD8 cells. And they can recruit neutrophils and mononuclear cells. These can damage tissues as well as can CTLs. So you can see the CD4s can be involved in immunopathology as well. They release these cytokines that recruit cells, and they also can release proteases, reactive radicals, peroxynitrate, remember, and also other cytokines like TNF-alpha, which can cause a lot of problems. So let's look at an example of that. We actually have examples of immunopathology that involves both subsets of CD4 positive T cells, Th1 and Th2. Here's an example of, of Th1. Now remember, the Th1 T cells are involved in maturation of, uh, of the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Tyler's virus is a picornavirus that infects mice. It causes demyelination, goes to the central nervous system, and results in the uh, dissolution of the myelin sheath that surrounds nerves. And people don't understand how this happens because the virus doesn't replicate in this area, but somehow it's causing demyelination. What we think is, is going on is that the CD4 positive Th1 cells are activating monocytic phagocytes. So they're releasing cytokines that act recruit and activate phagocytes, and those then demyelinate neurons, the, the monocytic phagocytes. They probably release superoxide and nitric oxide radicals. We talked about that last time, among other things, and these damage the myelin sheath. In addition, probably another cytokine, TNF-beta, uh, produced by the CD4 cells is probably also destroying oligodendrocytes, and these are the cells that make myelin. So a two-pronged attack on uh, demyelination. This is not the virus is doing, remember. This is the immune response against infection that's causing this problem. Now, when you get an infection and you have a rash of some kind, um, in the old days before immunization, we had lots of childhood rashes, but not anymore. But these are, when they do occur, they're delayed type, there's what we call delayed type hypersensitivity, which means they are caused by T cells coming to the area of infection. So the, each little pox or rash is an area of infection, and the T cells are coming to uh, try and clear the infection and a rash result. Many viruses do that, measles, smallpox, varicella zoster, and many others cause rashes all over the body, and these are DTH reactions. And this happens, so you have an infection in that focus, and Th1 cells and macrophages come in. They're recruited to the infected area, remember, by all the cytokines that are produced, and they cause the rash. Uh, these cells make other cytokines as well, which further brings in cells and these uh, increase the permeability of capillaries in the region, and all the cytokines and chemokines end up bringing in T cells. So you increase the permeability of a capillary. That lets the lymphocytes cross the capillary and get into the infected area. And then the chemokines recruit the T cells there. So that's what the rash is, the T cells coming in recruited by all this cytokine activity. So it's called a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. Anybody have ever had a tuberculin skin test? Yeah, so you know, you, you get a little stick with some tu uh, uh, tuberculosis antigen here. And if you have already been infected with tuberculosis, uh, 
then you have a very rapid immune response, which involves recruitment of T cells. And the little bump in redness that you get is a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction, T cells coming in. Okay. So once my daughter had an, an allergy test where they put 12 pricks into your skin with different allergens, and you can just watch the redness growing. And I said to my daughter, those are T cells coming in there. <laughs> All right, this is... Um, corneal inflammation caused by a herpes virus. Uh, it's called herpes stromal keratitis, one of the most common causes of blindness in developed countries. And it is probably entirely immunopathological, caused by CD4 positive Th1 cells. So here is an example of herpes stromal keratitis. You see this um, clouding of the cornea, so you can't see any longer. Repeated infections cause opacity and reduced vision. So what happens here, here's a cross-section of cornea. It's a, it's a relatively thin uh, tissue, of course. Uh, you have an epithelial layer at the top, which is the darker staining layer. You can see it better in this higher magnification. And then the stromal cells below it constitute the bulk of the cornea. So what happens is the virus, you get infected with herpes or you have a reactivation, it infects the corneal epithelium, these cells up here, it does not infect the stromal layers below. But what you get is inflammation of CD4 positive Th1 cells largely to the stroma. So you can see all these darker staining cells here, these are CD4 positive uh, T lymphocytes that are coming in, but these cells are not infected. So presumably they're recruited there by cytokines produced uh, by the infected cells. By the time these um, CD4 positive cells are attacking, the virus infection has actually stopped. So you can see this is sort of a late problem of the immune response. And these get damaged eventually, these stromal cells, by the cytokines that are produced and that recruit in the CD4 positive Th1 cells, which also produce more cytokines. So you get a lot of cell damage within this stromal layer. And that causes the opacity and the blindness. So this is a immunopathological reaction. The virus isn't even replicating here, but um, the cells that come in to try and clear the infection up here damage the, the cornea. Yeah? How, do, how does the herpes get into the eye in the first place? Does it spread from the cold sort? Dr. Silverstein. So this, comes, this can come from another person. What about if you have a, a, a lesion? You could, you could infect your eye by, if you have, yeah. Okay, so next time you have a fever sore, don't be putting your finger in your eye. That's the, that's the lesson. Because this is a problem in developed countries. That's us, right? Okay, it's immunopathological. CD4 positive Th2 cells, the other subset. Remember, these help B cells mature. Uh, respiratory syncytial virus, a really important virus of newborn children. The first few months of age, this targets them. Uh, this causes severe lower tract disease. It's not a cytolytic virus, so the disease is largely immunopathological. Um, now, if you do an experiment, you immunosuppress mice, you get lower severity lesions caused by the virus. Again, Im the immune response is involved, but if, involved, but if you transfer uh, virus-specific CD4-positive Th2 cells into those mice, you get worse disease. So these are the cells that are involved. Uh, the, in these mice, when you transfer these T cells, these Th2 cells, you get lesions with eosinophils. It's thought that these are recruited by cytokines that are produced by these Th2 cells, and the eosinophils themselves are actually causing the cell damage. Now, it, it, while we're talking about the two subsets of CD4 cells, Th1 and 2, it's useful to point out that the balance of the two is really important for determining the outcome of an infection. So an example is... Uh, a vaccine that was produced for RS virus. So this is a really important infection and we need to be able to prevent it. And so far, all vaccines have failed. There was one made many years ago, 
Uh, now, so the basis for this is that if you get infected and survive, then you're protected against subsequent lethal disease. So that means a vaccine might work. A formalin inactivated vaccine was developed a number of years ago. It didn't, it didn't elicit a Th1 response, which is what virus infect, infection elicits. It elicited a Th2 response. So remember, the CD4 cells can go either way, depending on what the dendritic cells are telling them in the, lymph, in the lymph node. But the vaccine is apparently not telling them the same thing that the virus, uh, live virus infection is. Uh, these children uh, could still be infected. So they did a vaccine trial with these children. They got infected, and many of them got more severe disease with a lot of eosinophils in the lung. Remember, in the mouse experiment, the eosinophils seemed to be causing pathology. So they had an imbalanced CD4 response by the vaccine. And just last year, it was determined that by formalin inactivating the vaccine, you treat the virus with formalin, it cross-links the proteins, makes the virus non-infectious. This made it a bad stimulator of, of a toll-like receptor. So one of the TLRs recognizes the virus proteins initially, and you get a very good uh, innate response, which then helps get high affinity antibodies. Remember, the innate and adaptive responses are linked. The innate response makes cytokines that helps mature a very good immune response, antibody response. Well, this formalin treatment uh, wrecked the ability of the virus to make a good TLR uh, response. So the result are low affinity antibodies produced, and these could not neutralize infection in these kids. So it shows you that the innate response is really important for getting good antibody production. Yes, did you have a question? Right. So when making the vaccine, why would you put in small amounts of tendon virus with another agent that would um, encourage a large TH response? Right. So that's what people are doing, trying to figure out how to formulate the vaccine so that you get a proper TH1 response. So we didn't actually know this. Now we know the reason for that is that we have a poor TLR stimulation. So we can try and make a, an antigen that does that properly. Yeah. Um, another example of an imbalanced immunopathological response is systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So if you're infected by a virus and your immune system isn't controlling it, uh, you start to get a lot of virus replication early on if your innate system can't control it. Remember, your adaptive defenses become mobilized. You get a global response. So it goes from local response to a global response. You have lots of antibodies and cell-mediated immunity, many cytokines produced. If this happens really quickly, and it can happen very quickly, or if the response is not proportional, you can get a large-scale release of cytokines and stress mediators. These can, these can actually kill you. So it's, look, it's sort of an overreaction to the infection. Something is imbalanced. Normally, we have checks to our immune responses that balance the re responses. There are cytokines that antagonize the positive action of other cytokines. But that can go awry sometimes, and then you get this uh, systemic inflammatory response. This happens uh, often when it's the first infection of a host with the virus, or say it's a, a zoonotic infection where you get a infection from an animal uh, Ebola and Marburg viruses are examples. They go from animals into people. They don't typically spread from person to person except in hospitals, but normally when there's an outbreak, it's a fresh outbreak from an animal. And so that's, that's sort of an example of uh, an infection where the virus is not co-evolved with the host. So we also call this a cytokine storm. You get a lot of cytokines produced, and this can be lethal to the host. And some people believe it might have been responsible for the extreme lethality of the 1918 influenza pandemic, where many, many millions of people died, but it's very difficult to prove uh, at this point. Other pathogens can do the same thing. You may have heard of toxic shock syndrome or toxic sepsis. These are bacteria. Bacterial infections can have the same effect. They can overwhelm your system. You have an enormous response of cytokine production, a cytokine storm, and it can be lethal. So that's systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So here's another example of how uh, the immune response can be pathological. This is West Nile virus encephalitis. So this is a virus borne by mosquitoes, recently introduced into the US. In a fraction of people who are infected, 
the virus goes into your brain and causes an infection of the brain matter itself that's called encephalitis. TLR3 seems to be playing a role in the ability of the virus to get into the brain. So if you take away the gene for TLR3, toll-like receptor 3, which recognizes viral RNA as foreign, if you take away the TLR3 gene in mice, they're more resistant to infection. They make fewer cytokines because TLR3, of course, is the sensor that says, aha, uh -huh, here's a virus RNA, let's make cytokines and get this immune response going. One of the cytokines that would be produced is TNF-alpha. TNF-alpha is known to compromise the blood-brain barrier. Remember, there is a barrier between the CNS circulation and the, the tissue proper, and that barrier can be compromised by cytokines like TNF-alpha. So if you take away TNF by taking away TLR3, the mice get less lethal infection. So here are some pictures of mouse brains that shows this. And what, what is done in these experiments um, is actually to inject the mice with a dye. And this dye uh, can get into the brain of wild-type mice. So you infect mice with West Nile virus, and then you inject also a dye. And the dye, by day three, gets into the brain. You can see the coloring, the blue color of the brain. But look, if you do the same experiment in a TLR3 knockout mouse, you infect, you infect them with virus and dye. The, the dye takes much longer to get in the brain, and, and it's much less. So these are mice now that are surviving, uh, have, have less severe encephalitis. And it looks like uh, TLR3 is affecting the permeability uh, of the CNS via TNF-alpha. And then on the right are some controls. The interesting one here is that um, you can inject a synthetic double-stranded RNA called poly-IC just by itself. Uh, into mice infected with, uh, I'm sorry, you just inject the double-stranded RNA into mice. This recognizes TLR, is recognized by TLR3. So that, those mice take up dye very readily uh, within 12 hours. But the knockout mice you see don't because they can't recognize the double-stranded RNA because they have no TLR3. So there's no dye going into the brain. So an example of how uh, an innate response can cause immunopathology. Dengue fever is an example of the role of B cells in immunopathology. So we've gone through all the cells, the T cells. Now here's an example of B cells, in other words, antibody production in immunopathology. So dengue is a flavivirus spread by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, right there. And this, this infection is endemic in many parts of the world. Billions of people are at risk. Last year, it act there were actually a few cases in um, Florida, in the Keys, and it actually spread from person to person, which suggests that it may be entering the U.S. as well. There are about 50 million infections a year globally, which, which makes it second only to malaria among the insect-borne diseases. It's the most common uh, mosquito-borne viral disease, dengue. So dengue is an evolving infection. Before 1981 in, in the South and Central Americas really wasn't a problem. But from here's the difference. After 1981, you can see it spread throughout. And a good reason for this is, that, is the used tire trade. Uh, we use tires here in the U.S. When we wear them out, they get shipped overseas in big container ships, and the tires fill with water, and the mosquitoes breed in them. So these tire container ships have spread Aedes aegypti all over the world, and this has been a consequence to dengue. It, spread, it has spread infection. So here are all the, in yellow, the areas that have the vector, and, and the red ones are where the vector and the mosquito overlap. So you can see uh, the portions of the, of the globe uh, where it is endemic. So this is a problem because of what happens after you get one infection. So the primary infection is usually asymptomatic, but you may get your standard symptoms of virus infection. You may have a fever and severe headache, back and limb pain and rash. It can have severe aches and pains in the bones. And the other name for this infection is breakbone fever. So it can be painful, but you usually recover in 7 to 10 days. In 1 in 14,000 of these primary infections, you get a syndrome called dengue hem hemorrhagic fever which is life-threatening. And this is when you are hemorrhaging. Your capillaries are leaking fluids and blood. 
and it can kill you. So, so much internal bleeding that patients develop shock syndrome, which is frequently fatal. Now, if you survive the first infection, most of the time you do, uh, you make antibodies to the virus, you have a memory response, of course, but there are four different serotypes of the virus, and if you're infected with one, you're not protected against the other three serotypes, and that's where the problem lies. So these non-protective antibodies can enhance the infection of monocytes with uh, another serotype of virus. So let's say you were infected with serotype 1, you recover, and then a few months later, you're infected with dengue 2 or 3. You make a memory response to dengue type 1. Those antibodies will bind dengue type 2, but they won't block its infection of cells. And antibodies, you know, have an FC portion, and that can attach to monocytes and macrophages. They have receptors. And that lets the virus get into these cells very efficiently, replicating them, kill them, and then they all release cytokines, and you get this um, hemorrhagic fever syndrome. So the infected macrophages release cytokines, and those cause the severe symptoms. So the incidence um, of hemorrhagic fever and shock syndrome is 1 in 90 and 1 in 50 after your second infection. So this is a big problem because this, this is often fatal. So that's why dengue is a big issue because we have so many primary infections right now. So here's a, a schematic of what is going on here. Here's a macrophage here in, in yellow. And it is, uh, here's dengue virus or the little black particles here. And um, they can be coated by antibodies that won't block their infectivity. If these antibodies were against the, the same serotype, those viruses would not be able to infect cells. But if they're the wrong serotype, they will let the virus get into macrophages by FC receptors. Those are these blue molecules here. The macrophages get infected. Then they start releasing cytokines like TNF-alpha, which makes your... your uh, Capillaries permeable, it activates complement, so you get plasma leakage. And then you have, of course, the macrophages being attacked by CTLs and it releasing even more cytokines. So you have, this is a theory, and there's some evidence for this in mice, but uh, it seems to make some sense. So there's a lot of um, effort to make a dengue vaccine at the moment uh, as a consequence. Uh, another form of immunopathology is the deposition of immune complexes. So when you uh, get a lot of virus multiplication, you know, you have a good antibody response within a few weeks. Um, you, in, in certain areas, um, you can get formation of virus antibody complexes. And these are not cleared by your reticular endothelial system. They circulate in the blood. Um, and so basically you have circulating virus receptor antibodies. If they're not cleared, they can clog tissues that have very fine capillaries. One of those is the kidney. Uh, so here's a diagram of uh, the capillary in a, in a kidney glomerulus. And um, these immune deposits are shown here in red. They can clog these interstitial spaces. And eventually the fluid cannot leave uh, the capillary area and it swells and you get you get kidney disease or glomerulonephritis. And this can happen in any area with small capillaries. You can get vasculitis and glomerulonephritis. And people who have had this happen in their brains end up having CNS symptoms like mental confusion. So uh, immune complex disease can be a problem. And again, this is immunopathology. It's the body responding, but something has gone awry. The other day we talked about these free radicals that can cause cell injury, uh, nitric oxide, which is made by the interferon-inducible nitric oxide synthase, and that can cause cell damage. Remember, macrophages and monocytes typically, or NK cells typically go to the infected monolayers, reduce, release these radicals, and they can kill the cells, and that can cause cell damage. So superoxide and nitric oxide are made during inflammation, uh, and low concentrations have a protective effect because they remove the infected cells but higher concentrations cause tissue damage. And as I said, I, I believe I said this last time, you can make mice that lack this enzyme and show that they have less pathology in response to certain virus infections. A couple of other ways that the virus interacts with the host in interesting ways, one of them is virus-induced autoimmunity. So autoimmune disease is when you make an immune response against your, host, your own tissues. And there are many ways that this happens, but it also happens during virus infection. And in particular, virus infections uh, 
in laboratory animals have been demonstrated clearly to trigger autoimmune responses. You infect an animal, the animal makes antibodies to the virus, and some of those react with the animal's tissues. Whether this is true in humans or not is still up in the air, as far as I can tell. How does this work? So there are a couple of mechanisms that we'll talk about. One is the virus might replicate in a site that is normally sequestered, so uh, the, it's not recognized by the immune response, but the consequence of virus multiplication there is that antigens are released, which are not normally recognized as self. Those are now exposed, and you get an autoimmune response. So that's one mechanism shown in animals. Uh, virus replication, as you know, leads to the production of cytokines or complement, and these activate proteases that can unmask normally hidden self antigens and that ends up making an antibody response against the self-antigen. Uh, then the third mechanism is what is called molecular mimicry. So those first two involve exposure by virus infection of self-antigens. The third one is something in common between the virus and, and our host proteins. Uh, so here we have a situation where viral and host proteins share antigenic determinants. <laughs> So you get infection, you get an immune response against the virus, and some of those antibodies react uh, against you as well. Now, if you take all the proteins encoded by us and you compare them to all the viral proteins, you're bound to get something similar, especially if you look at an epitope, which is short, about 10 amino acids or so. So there are a lot of common sequences. Um, and it's not clear whether this is actually a problem in people. You can show this experimentally in a variety of ways, but again, there's no clear evidence in people. So here are some example of epitopes, these short amino acid sequences shared between virus proteins and host proteins. Here's a capsid protein of polio and a sequence from the acetylcholine receptor. Now, you can make these peptides, you can make antibodies against them and show that the antibodies will cross-react. That's what this means here. But it's never been shown that in people you're making antibodies against your acetylcholine receptor if you're infected with polio. And again, you have examples here of papillomavirus and insulin receptor rabies and insulin receptor HIV and, and an immunoglobulin sequence and measles and corticotrophin. So, you know, in some cases these are pretty good homologies, but whether this is actually an issue is, is not really clear. Another effect of virus infection is immunosuppression. And that means that some virus infection have a global effect on reducing immune responses. <clears throat> Mechanisms involve the virus replicating in some immune cell. That will do immunosuppression. Uh, if you get infected as a fetus, you typically get tolerant to the virus, and then that can immunosuppress as you age. Uh, the virus infection can, can mess with cytokines or signaling that are in, that's involved in cytokine production that can cause immunosuppression and even these viroceptors and virokines the evasion that's done by them is a form of, of immunosuppression here's an experiment that illustrates what we're talking about so here what was done was to uh, take an, an animal and uh, actually I think this is a human with measles so they give a, a tine test a tuberculin tine test to these individuals. And uh, if they're uninfected, you get a certain amount of induration, the raising of the, of the, the swelling, the de delayed type hypersensitivity. And then a child who has measles, if you give them a tine test, initially they have no, they have no uh, um, induration from the TB test. So this is weeks after the rash of measles appears. So you can see very early on uh, the uh, delayed type hypersensitivity to the tuberculin antigen is suppressed by measles. And then eventually, as the measles infection wanes, then you get a, a reaction. So an example of immunosuppression by measles virus. So here are some examples. Measles is a big one. Um, it infects monocytes and thymic epithelial cells, causes reduced delayed type hypersensitivity, as I just showed you. And you get enhanced infections with other microbes when you have measles. Rubella, the same thing, infects lymphoid cells. The consequence here is that you get a persistent rubella infection, so you can't clear it. And of course, HIV, probably the best known immunosuppressor, the virus infects CD4 positive T cells, the helper T cells that you need for the, for the maturation of all those 
uh, antibody and CTL responses. So as a consequence, you get opportunistic infections and cancer, and that's what ends up killing you. Measles virus immunosuppression, the dendritic cells and monocytes actually get infected. So when that happens, <laughs> remember the dendritic cells are important for presenting the viral antigens to, thank you, T cells in the lymph nodes. So when measles infects them, that ability is compromised. So the, uh, the lymph nodes can never be informed properly that there's an infection going on. Uh, in addition, in measles-infected people, your, your T lymphocytes are decreased by 50%, and that's a consequence of not being educated in the lymph node. You also get aberrant cytokine responses. Uh, you get a skewing of the Th response from Th1 to Th2 because you get different cytokines that are produced. And we're going to end up with a few, a little discussion on what makes you susceptible to disease. So we've talked about specific ways about, we've talked about virulence and what regulates it. We've talked about immunopathology quite a bit. We're going to end up talking about susceptibility. Uh, the, you would like to know, of course, what human genes regulate susceptibility. This, is, this, this work starts in animal models. The MX gene, which we talked about the other day, determines the susceptibility of mice to influenza virus. There's also an FLV gene in mice that determines susceptibility to flaviviruses like West Nile virus. This gene encodes an interferon-stimulated protein, the 25 prime prime oligo-A synthetase. Unfortunately, neither of these play any role in human infections, so we can't learn very much from that. Here's an effect of the FLV gene on susceptibility. We have two strains of mice. Uh, that are either susceptible to infection, you infect them and you see virus multiplication very nicely in the susceptible strain. Uh, the resistant strain, very little virus production. Uh, the susceptible strain has a mutation in the FLV gene that makes it inactive, basically. And the FLV gene encoding 255 prime oligo synthesis is an important antiviral protein. Human determinants of susceptibility, not easy to find. Most of them encode components of the innate system. Uh, CCR5, a chemokine receptor, protects against HIV. So there are many people that have a natural deletion in CCR5, and they are resistant to HIV, and that apparently is, is fine. You, you don't need to have CCR5. But these individuals also seem to be more susceptible to West Nile virus infection. Mutations in toll-like receptor 3, and a second protein called UNC93B, which is needed for TLR3 signaling, predispose people to herpes simplex. So you can look in people now. We can sequence genomes and look at mutations associated with susceptibility. And this is one of the more recent ones that has come out. Herpes encephalitis. Herpes encephalitis, yes. Herpes simplex encephalitis, yeah. Viral encephalitis is infection of the PIA, the brain matter, with a virus. And meningitis is, is an infection of the meninges, right? So it can, as far as viruses go, there are other things that can cause encephalitis. But when we talk about viral encephalitis, we're talking about replication in the cells that comprise the, the brain matter, OK? MHC class 1 and 2 molecules have also been associated with resistance to infection. These, of course, present antigens to uh, lymphocytes. And it, it's been shown that certain MHCs are simply better at recognizing certain peptides as foreign than others. So for example, HIV, resistance to HIV in a number of people tracks with a certain MHC uh, molecule. So here's an example of this in mice. Two different strains of mice with two different MHC molecules, one very susceptible uh, and one quite resistant. And as I said, this tracks with people in terms of HIV infection as well. Age is a determinant of susceptibility. Very young and very old people are typically the most susceptible to infection. We believe that is in the young people, the immune response is immature. But that can sometimes help you. You have less immunopathology. Uh, for example, in infection of mice with lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus is lethal in adults, 
but infant mice survive. Remember, this is a CD8-mediated lethality, and infant mice simply don't have well-developed CD8 cells. The uh, susceptibility, uh, increased susceptibility of older people is multifactorial, less elastic alveoli in the lungs, for example, weaker respiratory muscles, diminished cost reflexes, all makes older people more susceptible to respiratory infections like influenza. So these are just two experiments looking at the susceptibility of rats to West Nile virus infection. And you can see this is age-specific LD50 titer. So this is increasing age, and this is the amount of virus you need to kill 50% of the animals. So at a very young age, uh, you need a lot of virus to kill half the animals, and you need less as you get older. And the same goes for age-specific replication in the brain. Uh, three months of age, um, not very much replication. But as you age, you have more replication. Sorry, 1.5 days, the most replication. 16 days, slightly less, and three months, uh, no replication. Uh, this is an epidemic in the Faroe Islands, which are north of the UK, in 1846. And you can see the high mortality in the less than one age group and the greater than 70 age groups. Everyone in between, pretty low mortality, but the very young and the very old, particularly susceptible. What is this all about? Well, we have one specific mechanism in mice infected with Synbis virus. Uh, if you infect very young mice, they get brain infections. But as the mice get older, they're resistant to brain lethal infection. The reason is this protein called BCL2, which is anti-apoptotic. As mice age, there is more BCL2 produced, and that protects the mice against apoptosis induced by infection. There are, there are exceptions to this very young, very old rule, okay? For example, respiratory syncytial virus causes severe infections in infants but doesn't do anything in older people. Uh, and this is probably because the immune response of the older people is matured. In 1918, the flu pandemic was lethal for the very young and the very old. That's consistent with what we've said, but also for adults, young adults 18 to 30 years old. And we don't know why that is. Many other infections are milder at young ages rather than old ones. Polio, for example, is very mild at a young age, and we don't really understand that. It could be that there's a balance of protective and pathogenic responses. So maybe when you're young, you don't make as many immunopathological responses to infection, and so some of these infections are less severe. This is an ex a graph showing this unusual uh, mortality in 1918 for influenza. So here's flu in the U.S. from 1911 to 1915. The young and the old are the most susceptible. This is death rate according to age. And in 1918, there was this unusual spike in the middle in addition to the young and old. We still don't understand why that is. <clears throat> and here's an example, another example of increasing uh, mortality just in old age. This is West Nile virus mortality in Israel in 2000. The very young were fine, but uh, here the decade of life, the, not only the incidence of severe disease, but mortality was specific to the older individuals. So again, it's, it's not simply the case that the very young and the very old are always more susceptible. Other determinants, uh, gender, males are slightly more susceptible. Pregnant women, in particular, are highly susceptible to infection with a number of viruses. And you may remember that uh, when pandemic influenza emerged in 2009, pregnant women seemed to be dying at a, at a faster rate than others. Malnutrition also increases susceptibility because of its effects on the immune response, and this is why measles is 300 times more lethal in developing countries because of malnutrition. It can be a, a, a death sentence in those countries. Cigarette smoking increases susceptibility to respiratory infections, no question. Air pollution as well, and stress. Stress causes increased susceptibility, but remember, stress spelled backwards is desserts. <laughs> So when you get stressed, have dessert, and you won't get a virus infection. <laughs> okay, so next week, there's no class, of course. Um, we have the following week, an exam on Wednesday. So this weekend, I will post some practice questions. Okay, so check the website or courseworks. I will also post uh, 
a quiz on Sunday so you can keep up practicing wherever you are. Okay, so check that out. And I will have office hours. Probably Esther will do a review. She'll contact you next week. But I will have office hours next week. I will post them one day next week. So if you have any questions, you can come see me.